So I'm going to give you a, a very quick overview of NCDC. I think uh, some folks have good familiarity with our organization. Um, others of you may not. Um, within NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, there are roughly six uh, line offices. And under each of those line offices, there are uh, specific programs. We fall under the Satellite Information Service. Most everyone has heard of the National Weather Service, so that's one of the six line offices. We are in uh, the Satellite Information Service called NESBIS. One of the overarching um, themes that NOAA has established in the last five years or so is a commitment to what we call the three S's, uh, science, service, and stewardship. And really, here at the National Climatic Data Center, we are organized around those thematic areas. But we have a very specific mission that uh, fundamentally um, speaks to our reason for being. And that reason for being is being the archive for all the weather and climate information for the United States. We are the official archive. And as such, we have a responsibility to not only take the information that we get on a day-in, day-out basis uh, related to um, environmental information, even more broadly than weather and climate, but take that information and make it uh, useful to the public. And so you see the pyramid up here with uh, uh, four A's, acquisition of the data, the archive of the data, the access of the data, and then assessment uh, activities related to the data. So uh, fundamentally, that is who we are. Uh, and that speaks to our mission statement. We receive data certainly from um, a vast uh, array of sources, uh, from paleoclimate records uh, that are captured by our group uh, located out in Boulder, Colorado, to um, in situ weather observations, remotely sensed weather observations. All of this information comes in in a, a torrent of bits and bytes and also paper records. Uh, that are digitized or imaged or, or uh, both. We have a safe, safe storage now of approximately 10 petabytes of climate information. Uh, that's uh, um, almost enough for two candles for every person on Earth. We're getting, getting there quickly. And then we have a data download rate of approximately two petabytes, over two petabytes per year, which is a just a really incredible exponential growth uh, since just uh, a few short years ago. And you can see that in the trend line in this graphic. Uh, the, the real um, geometric growth is due to increases um, primarily in the model data that we're bringing in and the radar uh, data and the satellite data. Um, so that, that's really um, a trend we expect to continue. To put it into context, we are at approximately 10 petabytes, um, and it's growing as we go into 2013. By 2030, we, we will certainly be bringing um, in a, a high volume and have an archive of over 300 petabytes. One of the things I want to highlight while we're thinking about the archive, kind of the core of what we're all about, we have a data archive system called the Comprehensive Large Array Data Stewardship System. And this is an enterprise a secure storage uh, solution for us to bring together all our data holdings in a, in a very systematic manner and begin to look at ways of bringing in additional data streams. Uh, for example, within the satellite information service that we're under, there's also a geophysical data center and an oceanographic data center. Both of those are anticipated to be more closely integrated with our organization and provide those types of data as well. So we continue to grow in volume and in the breadth of the themes that we capture. So as I said, the, the demand for this data continues to grow. Um, we have in purple here the satellite. Uh, you can see since um, FY08, which is October 08 to September of 09, we've seen a, a tremendous growth in that area. We've seen a spectacular growth in the amount of uh, model data that has been brought in. And, and so we expect both of these areas to continue to grow because we need higher and higher volumes of data to do more sophisticated assessments um, to uh, answer questions that are related 
to a, a, an array of questions um, that the community has. And there's lots of adaptation-related questions that we're being asked to answer. We serve a, a broad uh, customer base. As Tammy mentioned, we have a, a sectoral engagement program that reaches out to um, over a dozen different sectors uh, that, are, that are specifically uh, working with us. And we, we engage these groups. And the workshop today is, is just another opportunity for us to reach out to specific groups of folks. So not only do we have a sectoral cut, but we also have a regional cut to our ability to reach out to customers. And we have, of course, we have representation from the Midwest Regional Climate Center. We work with our uh, six regional climate centers. We have um, five uh, regional climate service directors that, that are federal employees working for NCDC that are also out in the field cultivating those relationships, understanding what kinds of, of transactions need to occur in, in order to serve the data needs of others. Uh, just a little side story. When I was um, when I was 10 years old, I lived in St. Louis, Missouri, and they had Monsanto had a Earth uh, Science Fair. And my first uh, use of NCDC data was to um, get data for my science project. And my science project was, you know, get the weather off the TV, the temperature forecast, and compare that to what was recorded at Lambert Field. So I got it ordered in an LTD, mailed it to me. And that was my science project, you know, doing a little fifth grade statistical analysis. So I guess if this were the hair club for men, I would say that I was a member very early on. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's much more sophisticated now than it was back then. Even when I started here in 1990, we had a very large uh, portion of our customer base dedicated um, dedicated our efforts to making sure the LCDs and the CDs and, and a very small number of products were provided and that answered a lot of questions. Now we have a more sophisticated user base, as you well know, that use um, all kinds of models, use GIS systems. So we need to be responsive. And, and the best way we can do that is to understand the needs of our users and have the dialogue. So that's, that's really a lot about what we're doing today and tomorrow. Bless you. So the um, U.S. Climate Reference Network, uh, USCRN, is NCDC's operational observational network. That's the, the one area where we actually have um, observations that we control coming into the organization. This is a fantastic program. It's existed since 2000. It's very forward-looking with uh, the idea that you have 50 to 100 years of um, records that you want to keep in a consistent manner. So you place the, the um, redundant uh, instrumentation suite in a location that's going to have minimal land use land cover change so that you can have a, a fairly robust record. And there's all kinds of, from a micrometeorological standpoint, there's such a treasure trove of information that we haven't even yet begun to tap in this area. And it really informs um, a lot of different sectors, including this one. Uh, I think that's that's a really exciting thing. We are have 114 of these stations, um, and we're building out in Alaska uh, with the goal of having good uh, coverage up there. And uh, Rocky, I'm sure, will speak to this uh, in a while. Uh, we have data sets. Uh, we organize ourselves around a combination of in situ sets and remotely sent sets. Uh, the most uh, uh, popular uh, data set in terms of specific requests tied to the land surface temperature. And we have a uh, global historical climatology uh, network, and we have a monthly data set that we produce. If you look at the map of the world, you see that you know, we're, we're well represented, um, certainly in North America and Europe, as you might expect, uh, but we have good coverage throughout the world. So the land data set is uh, coupled with oceanographic uh, um, information to give us a comprehensive picture for analysis <coughs> and monitoring. For about five years, we've had a climate data records program, a formal climate data records program that's uh, been focused on um, homogenization of satellite information. And the basic idea is that once you launch um, a um, platform into space, it begins to degrade for a number of different reasons. 
and uh, has a lifespan. And so you need to have some sort of homogeneity adjustment to the data so that you're comparing apples today to apples tomorrow. And as one vehicle falls out of the sky, you have another one up there, and you can um, compare the two. The same kind of approach that we've used with in situ data uh, throughout our history as, for example, the Weather Service has gone from using mercury thermometers to using uh, platinum resistance thermistors or, or other kinds of digital sensors. So we face that challenge. The challenge of inhomogeneity adjustments and statistical adjustments is a powerful one. Uh, and it, per, it, it really is one that we've been dealing with in this organization for 40 years or more. The basic idea behind climate records uh, is the homogeneity adjustments, uh, but there's also a, a calibration uh, piece uh, to the process as well. And at the end of the day, what we want to do with these records is apply them to um, specific um, conditions, specific applications. And so we have um, activities to, to try to do that, and we're over we're moving to uh, a very high number of, um, of applications that are related to the uh, climate data records. With the capital C, capital D, and capital R, keeping in mind that we use the same techniques in many other data sets throughout the center and with our partners. We're very fortunate to have the uh, Paleoclimatology Branch. Uh, that's uh, a part of our organization located, again, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, they study past climate using tree rings, ice cores, corals, ocean sediment, and other um, natural indicators of, um, of temperature that they can get their proxy measures for, uh, for temperature uh, predominantly. Uh, the sites are worldwide, and this allows us to go back in time. Certainly, if you look at um, programs on television like NOVA, and other programs like that, you, you've probably seen where the ice cores have been highlighted. And that's uh, the classic uh, paleo record, that in the dendro uh, climatology with the tree rings. Uh, but this is an area in our field that is growing and maturing, and there's new opportunities to crack open uh, new proxies. And so it's a very exciting time uh, for this particular group in taking the instrumental record, which generally has some fidelity back to the mid to late 19th century and coupling that to the, to the paleoclimate record gives us a way of putting um, climate variability and change into a, a solid context. We have international partnerships. And one of the great success stories uh, at NCDC is the ability to build uh, global data sets that are uh, useful for scientists from throughout the world. Again, it's a matter of bringing everything into one uh, database, having a consistent uh, set of information that people can utilize. And um, the, the screen capture shows the International Best Track Archive for Climate Stewardship, 1842 to 2011. It's being updated uh, as we go forward. This is a common story. We, we try to bring, build the data set, and then continue to um, add to it as we get forward in time. And uh, you can imagine the research applications and um, the sectoral groups that can benefit from this information. Another really great story is the, the drought efforts that are being done through the center. The National Integrated Drought Information System is um, has a drought portal, drought.gov, uh, almost everyone is familiar, even if you've watched uh, the news on an infrequent basis, that you've probably seen the drought monitor on television in some form. We have a weekly U.S. drought monitor that uh, gives us an assessment of what the drought condition is. Given that drought is a creeping disaster, not a, an abrupt disaster, um, keeping your finger on the, on the pulse of um, what's going on in the field is a non-trivial activity but it's powerfully important to many, many sectors. So we got representatives in this room from the Midwest, and, and you have a sense from your community of what the impacts are. And uh, we can put that into a, a, a robust context, which uh, is, is really critical for us uh, as a society. 
societally, we also look at specific uh, impacts. Uh, snow is, is one example of an impact. Um, we, again, are trying to package information in a way that's useful to um, our customers, the American public and sectors and regions. Uh, this particular product is a regional snowfall index that uh, gives you a sense of what the impacts are from a, a snowstorm, the same way you would look at a um, tornado Fujita scale or a hurricane Cypress Simpson scale. Just gives you a basis for understanding the, the context for um, calculating socioeconomic loss, which is extremely important. Our monitoring uh, program, and, and Deke will speak to this uh, as the, the chief of, of that group, uh, does a wonderful job of putting together um, a series of regular reports uh, related to the conditions of weather and climate in the United States and globally. And that drumbeat, week to week, month to month, just is, is extraordinarily helpful to having people understand um, you know, where we are what's the state of our climate. In the uh, entry to the room, there are state of the climate reports. This is a supplement to the bulletin of the American Meteorological Society that provides a comprehensive soup to nuts overview of the state of the climate uh, for the previous year. I invite you to pick up a copy of that. We can also point the people on the phone to an uh, electronic uh, version of that document. That speaks to uh, the broader community consensus of where we are with, with the climate on a year-to-year -year basis. Very, very important in the times we live in. Sea surface temperature is um, also monitored very closely. Obviously, there are implications to um, how uh, the sea surface informs the uh, coupled ocean and atmosphere system that we live in. So that's a, yet another area of interest. And then we have climate normals. Anyone who's ever watched a local newscast remembers the almanac portion of the weather uh, brief uh, that occurs uh, on, on TV. And so we compute these, and we do these in a robust manner. Anthony is our expert, and he'll speak to us momentarily about that. Uh, but you can, um, um, I'll leave it at that. Climate.gov. Let me kind of close things out um, so that you um, can get to the next speaker in a timely fashion. Climate.gov was developed to act as a one-stop shop for uh, narrative information and some data information uh, on climate. And so one of the great things about climate.gov is that it gives uh, uh, vignettes and it gives plain language uh, summaries that uh, you can look for, both out of personal interest and from the standpoint of being uh, uh, one that meets environmental information. Uh, there are videos, it's an interactive website, so I've now mentioned two portals, Gov.gov and Climate.gov. The National Assessment Activity is a third dot something that will be um, on, the, on the web in the future because assessments historically, as you see up here, have been static reports. Okay. You have a legal requirement to produce a report every certain number of years. We do that nationally, and we do it in, in the context of the IPCC. Either way, we've historically done snapshot reports over three or four year intervals. That is changing. We are beginning to look ahead to doing a sustained reporting mechanism, not unlike what we're doing now with our state of climate activities here at NCDC. They require us to have engagement in two directions, both upstream with the science community, the collections of experts in all different areas of uh, our field, and then it requires engagement with the user community downstream, you. So I think we are at a real inflection point in being able to serve our, um, our community and it well in both, uh, both domains. I won't uh, bore you with the org chart, but it wouldn't be a government briefing without an org chart, of course. Uh, we, we have presently four divisions, two science divisions, one for in-situ data, one for remotely sensed data, and then we have a services division uh, that is really speaking um, in a focused manner to what you're doing here today, and then we have a support group. 
the uh, value partnership with Kix, I, I can't say enough about that um, partnership. It, it really is vital to our growth and maturation as a science organization. So with that, I'll stop. And you can tell me how far behind I am. What time? We're moving right off. Okay, great. Great. Jonathan is going to help us transition over to the next presentation. And I do have one comment. Um, those of you dialed in through the phone in the remote locations, may I please trouble you to mute your lines, please? Thank you. Before I start my presentation, are there any questions for Tim? I, I do want to say that I have a, a graduate degree in urban and regional planning. Can you talk later? <laughs> <laughs> Good show. <laughs> one more. One more. Go to number three. Yep. Are there any questions on the phone for Tim? Just, just a general comment here. Um, it, it may uh, be covered in the next uh, uh, talk, but I just want to throw it out there. Uh, I, there was no sense the resolution of these data sets and, uh, and the utility or the usefulness of the, the data sets to the end user. So if, if, if Tim could speak to that, that would be great. Okay. I'd be happy to. Um, the, the general rate uh, was a kind of a broad brushstroke, but clearly we have 